Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And, and indeed, it's always uh, good to stand in this place, uh, particularly uh, after a little bit of confusion that we just went through in terms of the voting. Uh, I can tell you, Mr. Speaker, Bill C-29, the Business or Budget Implementation Act, there's no confusion about it. It's actually a train wreck. And actually, it is, should not be called an implementation bill. It maybe should be referred to as a renovation bill. Because when something is as disastrously wrong in the economy of this country as it is now, it takes not only severe renovations, but it takes a change of culture uh, within a government. Mr. Speaker, the riding of Lambton Kent Middlesex is in southwestern Ontario, very much a rural riding uh, made up of small and medium sized businesses. I, quite honestly, in the riding, I don't have uh, a large business. What we are made up of is uh, hard working middle income folks and families that get up every day and go to work and are strong entrepreneurs that generate wealth and employment. And yes, uh, something that is hard to come across in this budget that stimulates anything, but these folks in my riding actually give jobs. And it's because they have endured some hard, <clears throat> hard times, but they've been able to buckle down and survive up until some of these some of these uh, uh, proposals that are in the budget are going to come forward. I guess, like anyone, Mr. Speaker, when you talk about uh, what you're going to do as a government, one of the things that rings strong within a riding like mine, and I know uh, in ridings across this country, is that during the campaign there were a lot of talk about what they were going to do, and, and actually didn't say about what he was going to do. He actually made promises. One of the things that, that disturbed people, and we were in the riding this past week uh, on Legion Week as we celebrated and thanked our veterans across this great country of Canada. We thanked the veterans that are alive, but we also recognized with, uh, with our hearts the work and the a commitment that those that gave their life so that we would be able to be in a place like this, that we would be able to have free discussion about topics that are important to Canada. And yes, so we celebrated uh, Legion Week and thanked uh, those that gave their lives for us in this great country and to our veterans that are there. And yes, also I always commented and commended those people that are in uniform right now today that are standing uh, up for us in Canada, not only in our great nation of Canada, but abroad in many countries. But when you break that promise, as this government has done in so many ways, it takes, uh, it takes a bit of the heart out of people. And quite honestly, Mr. Speaker, what happens is that when you break your promises on these didn't happen like three or four years after the election. They happened within days and weeks uh, of, the, uh, of this government being sworn in. And so what it does, it, it takes away the credibility, not only of the government, but quite honestly, of all of us that are elected people. Because they say, well, we just don't trust any of you. And that's very unfortunate. So let me just tell you a little bit about what happened in breaking promises. And, why it, it was so detrimental to people in my riding, and I'm sure across the country. Remember in the election, he talked about this teeny-weeny modest deficit that the Liberal government was going to hand over to hand, uh, Canadians, uh, and that it would be $10 billion deficit. Mr. Speaker, and we've heard this time and time again, but it wasn't within year was actually within weeks of that, that $10 billion then escalated to $30 billion. That is 
300 percent. That is three times of what the projection was. So when we talk about billions of dollars, Mr. Speaker, actually the ordinary Canadian really doesn't wrap their head around what a billion dollars is, but they can wrap their head around what it actually means. So let me give you a little example of what it means because this is what happens when you don't do what you say you're going to do and you expect the ordinary Canadian to believe you and then understand when you break the promise that it doesn't mean much. That's really what they want you to think. So I have a small business guy. He goes into the, into the bank. He's got a, a, he's got a proposal. And he's got a business plan that goes with that. And he goes to the banker of the lending institution. He said, this is my business plan. I need a million dollars. And this is how I'm going to bring it forward. And this is how I'm going to pay it back. And this is what my business plan talks about, the growth. Well, you know the interesting part about it? In six weeks, he goes back to the bank and he said, you know what? I got the same business plan. I still have those same sort of gross in my projection, but you know what? I don't need a, a million dollars to grow my business. I actually need $3 million now. Now, I don't know if there isn't anybody on that side that's ever had a business. I don't know. Maybe there's nobody on that side that's actually had to put together a, a business plan and then go to a financial institution. But I can tell you, if you did what I just talked to you about in a small business that could have been any business in my writing, and went to that lending institution, I can tell you the banker would show you the door. Well, the difference is, Mr. Speaker, is that the banker can't show this government the door today because the taxpayers are the lender. Maybe in four years, they will be able to show them the door. That is just the, the, the promise that they were going to cut taxes for small businesses. Not, don't, want to, don't ever want to lose a revenue source from a tax. Remember the other one, the revenue neutral? Uh, what was it called? The promise to make the tax plan revenue neutral when he was going to take from the top part of the rich and give to the, to the poor, the, the lower income group. That was revenue neutral. Well, that took about three weeks to come across where it wasn't revenue neutral. It was actually about a $2 billion hit to the taxpayers of Canada. My point, Mr. Speaker, is the, the government right now has absolutely no credibility. They've now got a debt that is escalating. They have no plan in how they're going to pay it back. When the, when the Prime Minister was asked about when are you going to balance the budget? And today it was asked in question period about to the finance uh, minister when you were going to balance the budget. Well, we actually don't know. And the prime minister indicated earlier that he didn't know how much the deficit would actually grow to. I say to Canadians and to my small business people and to families, folks, we've got a serious concern. When you have a deficit growing and a debt now that is escalating, that some will say are going to cost us another $5 billion a year in interest payments. Back where I come from, when you're in a hole, the best way to quit is quit digging. But I got a sense, Mr. Speaker, that that isn't the culture of this Liberal Party. They're on this, this glorious trip of big deficits. You, you're just going to spend our way out of debt. I don't know where that's actually worked. I can tell you from a business perspective, it just does not work. So, Mr. Speaker, I see I'm running to the end of the time, and, and uh, I'll be more than glad to take into, uh, questions. But I'm just concerned that this budget, you've betrayed Canadians, you've broken promises to Canadians, not you, Mr. Speaker, but the government has. And so this... Business Budget Implementation Act, Mr. Speaker, unfortunately, will not be supported by myself or by my party. Thank you very much. Questions and comments? The Honourable Member for Fleetwood Port Kells.
Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I wonder if the honourable member would reflect on the what uh, his uh, former government claimed as a balanced budget, considering that there was uh, billions of dollars in lapsed funding that was unspent from programs that they had promised but hadn't delivered. They sold the shares in uh, General Motors for a loss. All of it was to really construct the appearance of a balanced budget where clearly none existed. Not to mention the fact that his government had us in deficit when times were good after inheriting many years of surpluses. So perhaps he can reflect on that in terms of the, the virtues of a balanced budget as the Conservatives saw it. I will member for Lambton, Kent, Middlesex. Thank you. I, I, actually, that's a great question because when we were in government, I don't know, I, I don't know that the member was here then, but in <clears throat> 2008, we actually went through the greatest recession that this country had seen since the Great Depression of the 30s. We actually, at the time, uh, uh, walked through that with uh, how we were going to go into that in terms of our economy and an exit plan and how we would come out of it. Interesting, this government is now not in any recession. They just seem to be content and driven to create a recession in Canada with the spending that they're doing. But Mr. Speaker, they, they and, and when, we, when we came in, is it easy to balance the budget like the Liberals did? cut all the transfers to the provinces, cut health care transfers, absolutely. You can, if you just download everything onto somebody else, it's easy. We didn't do any of that, Mr. Speaker. We actually increased our transfers. We cut taxes to the, to the uh, Canadians to the lowest in 50 years. We cut transfers, uh, we improved transfer taxes or uh, transfers to the province. And so we had a great record. On top of that, one year, no net new jobs across the road. Out of a recession in 2008, how many net new jobs? 1.2 million, 80% full-time, 80% in the private sector. Thank you. Questions and comments? The Honourable Member for Winnipeg North. Speaker, and you know, I, I, obviously there's no surprise. I disagree with what the, the, the member is saying. I, I believe that Canadians have reason to be very excited about the first budget that was presented by uh, the Prime Minister and the, and the Liberal government, uh, because in many ways, one could say many promises were made in the last federal election, and those promises were in fact fulfilled. We can talk about the, the tax increase to Canada's uh, wealthiest, something in which the Conservatives voted against. We can talk about the middle class tax cut, of seven, uh, which affected 9 million uh, Canadians, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Health care workers, industrial floor workers, you name it. Nine million Canadians benefited by that uh, tax cut to the middle class. We can t and the Conservatives voted against that too. Uh, we can talk about the child care benefit uh, program, lifting literally thousands of children out of poverty. We can talk about the, uh, the commitment to our uh, seniors, the GIS increase, again, lifting thousands of seniors out of poverty. These are all commitments that were, that were made in one form or another, and these were commitments that were fulfilled. Filled. So my question to the member, would, would he not at least, at the very least, acknowledge that there were many aspects of the platform that are actually not only, uh, that are uh, realized in this very budget in which we are voting on? A member for Lambton, Kent, Middlesex. And how they change things and how they put the question forward. You know, they have a backhanded way, so he, he listed all the ways in which they think they may have actually helped the people. Then they turn around. What do they do? Well, we're going to bring in a Canada pension plan increase. We're going to increase EI. We're going to bring in a carbon tax. We're going to increase the taxes on Canadians. We're not going to reduce the business tax on businesses. Oh, by the way, who do business people, small businesses hire? People. So what you give a little at the one side, you have the back-ended way of saying it because what you do then is scoop it from these people in another way. Who is going to be most affected by the carbon tax? Seniors, low-income and middle-income people. I live in a rural riding, farmers. Every time they fill the combine up, it's going to cost them another 100 bucks. That's not good for the middle-class income people or 
for Canadians.